Hi, I'll be re-recording this session as apparently yesterday when I recorded, uh, somehow it didn't get recorded. I hope it gets recorded now. So we'll be solving one more SVQ. Uh, but yesterday when I was talking, I'll just uh, summarize that in brief. Uh, there were some of the candidates uh, th were asking me whether it's better to do post-graduation first and then give the Australian exam or just give the Australian exam. See, to answer that question, you should be very well defined on the aim of your life. If you want, if you are really passionate about dentistry and you want to do post-graduation, then you should do that first. You can always give the Australian exam later on. There is no age limit, time limit. I myself gave ADC exam 10 years after almost I finished my post-graduation. But uh, I don't think so. I would have done post-graduation 10 years after I would have graduated. It becomes difficult, you know, due to various reasons. So, uh, if you're really passionate about dentistry, do your post-graduation. <clears throat> the second question that popped up was, uh, everybody wants to clear uh, their All India post-graduate exam. I mean, I'm talking about the Indian candidates whose results just came out and uh, many of them could not get the seat of their choice. Uh, you all want to clear in first attempt. Even India did not land on moon on the first attempt in spite of having so many engineers. I'm not saying you can't, but then you should not give up. You know, I myself did not clear the uh, All India Postgraduate exam in my first attempt. It's not about clearing, actually. It's about securing that rank. You know, everybody clears the exam, but you have to fall in that particular rank bracket to achieve the seat of your choice. So, uh... It's just 100 seats, I mean, and there are thousands of candidates. Uh, so you just have to be so competitive and better than everybody else. And for that, you have to devote like hours and hours of studies in the right direction. In my first attempt, I read everything, the dental side, the medical side, which was my biggest mistake because I did not get time to revise. So if, because I did not revise, I knew the question paper. I just got confused in the answers. But in my second attempt, I learned from those mistakes. And I learned many other things in my life because that was a drop year for me. And uh, that was my only choice uh, to give the exam uh, because after that, my parents wouldn't allow me to appear for any more exams. So I gave my heart and soul. I had faith. I studied for 14 hours a day and I did clear so you can clear i'm a living example of it yes you may not clear in the first attempt again i'm a living example of it do i remember that year my drop year where i did not clear and i was appearing from the second attempt <clears throat> and there was a lot of personal turmoil going on no i don't i don't remember you will also not remember eventually so if you're focused on what you want give a heart and soul attempt again but if you think you just want to earn money and start practicing and for that um, Australia, Canada, US, any other is a better place and appear for that exam. But even in those exams, you may not clear everything in the first shot. So don't be dejected. We humans are not meant to achieve everything at the first attempt. Okay. It's a cycle. It's a learning process where you learn. And if you don't clear, it doesn't mean you are a failure. You are not. It just this attempt did not work out. As simple as that. Okay, so don't take it personally and uh, you're not wasting your year or not you're losing the time of your life. It's nothing like this. This life is not mortal. I mean, it's not immortal. <laughs> we are mortals and we all are going to go away one day. So this entire life, it's just going to be nothing. So uh, just because you feel you could not clear in the first attempt you'll be wasting another year no you're not you'll be learning a lot of things and anything that you learn is never a waste even if that means uh, you are going through your hard times and your own people are troubling you you learn a lesson from it that you should not do this to somebody who's going through a hard time or how the world behaves when you're a hard time even your own friends for that matter you learn a lot of things and that makes you a better person so anyways let's move on uh, to another uh, scenario based question for today <clears throat> an overseas patient attending your clinic keyword overseas overseas means he's not from Australia and probably uh, if it's come from outside he's gonna go back there <laughs> so he has short time with a concern of discoloration and loss of structure of his front teeth so there is discoloration and loss of structure 
he will leave the country in a few days time like i mentioned so whenever you have somebody who's visiting from outside you have to be very clear in your treatment plan that it has to be short and precise it should not take a long duration because if it does then the patient won't be there for you to treat right so uh, when i see this picture immediately i know it's not caries okay it it has got something to do with the inherent formation of enamel dentin and the dental structures basically and i see the canines are also infected i mean affected so when the canines are affected then i rule out the possibility of just the molars and the incisors then i feel it's more of a generalized or it's either something else now let's see on the question what it's asked what is the defect visible above ameloblastoma it, it doesn't look like ameloblastoma amelogenesis imperfecta had they said then i would have wondered dentinogenesis imperfecta see dentinogenesis imperfecta doesn't look like this i'll tell you how it looks like it looks like this the enamel in dentinogenesis imperfecta is well formed but the dentin is not formed and enamel is attached to the dentino enamel junction which is scallop shaped you know you must have studied in your oral, oral pathology now when dentin is not formed properly uh, the enamel doesn't have a sound hold on the dentin to stay so eventually it starts stripping off also because the dentin is not formed properly it gives this translucent grayish hue like a thing so this is very different from enamel hypomineralization or enamel hyperplasia and usually in dentinogenesis imperfecta almost all the teeth are affected and it runs in families 99% of time very rarely only 1% would be affected by this it's uh, autosomal dominant uh, so this when you see this picture and you will yourself encounter very few cases of dentinogenesis imperfecta like in thousands you may get one but hyperplasia and hypomineralization you'll get frequently but anyways by the look of it you can make out whether it's dentinogenesis or not and of course you can take an obg to confirm it so going back to the question uh this does not look like dentinogenesis imperfecta incisor molar hypomineralization and enamel hypoplasia now you can be confused between these two now how to dissipate your confusion is that firstly uh, when i had seen this picture i had mentioned that i can see the canines are also affected so no longer molar incisor hypomineralization is the option but in case the canines were not affected and they would have shown only the incisors and you would have been like now what so then you need to understand the basic difference between hypomineralization and hypoplasia in hypomineralization what is hypomineralization hypo mineralization means less minerals in the tooth when i talk about minerals it can be calcium phosphorus whatever the tooth is formed of now but the classic picture of a hypomineralization is that the structure of the tooth is very well formed but you see spots inside you know these are the defects where there is deficiency of the minerals and that's why they are more porous and that's why when the light reflects they absorb more because there is more water than the rest of the structure so the structure is very well formed like any other normal tooth structure there is no deficiency in the formation of the structure but hypoplasia hypoplasia means the structure is only not formed so i'll show you the case of hypoplasia which is exactly like this now if you see there is a defect in the structure itself here and here there is a big gap out here and here also so if the structure was very well formed the outer layer is intact but inside you see spots then it's hypomineralization but if the structure is only not formed then it's hypoplasia so i will go with enamel hypoplasia on this because again here canines are affected so it cannot be incisor and molar hypomineralization and besides it does not even look like hypomineralization so i hope this is clear now if you you should always sit with a pen and paper when you are watching my videos right read more about incisor molar hypomineralization hypoplasia amelogenesis imperfecta dentinogenesis imperfecta okay now what treatment would you recommend for this condition now we know that the patient 
has come from abroad and is going to travel within a few days. So we have to do something which is quick, efficient. Now fill the defect with GIC. Mm, doable, not a wrong option. Fill with resin modified GIC. Even better option. Do anterior composite filling. Okay. Veneers. Veneers is not wrong, uh, but it's more expensive. And besides, it requires more time. You'll have to send the thing to the lab and the lab is going to take time to, you know, get it back, etc., etc. So unless uh, the question mentions the patient request for laminates or veneers, veneers is not the right option. GIC and resin, mo resin modified GIC is good for posterior because it doesn't have that aesthetic finish. And anterior composite filling is the correct option of choice here because A, it's not a carious tooth. It's a defect. So you can easily do a composite and give it a very nice finish to the sh shade matching, etc. So the best option amongst all this would be do anterior composite filling. Now, which one of the following is not a function of a rubber dam with regard to endodontics? Now, this, this sub-question has got nothing to do with the scenario-based question, but ADC does give questions like this. Like, it will start with a scenario and suddenly it will switch with any random dental MCQ like this. So, which one of the following is not a function? Which means the others are a function of rubber dam. So let's see what is not a function. Decreases salivary contamination, that is a function. Increases visibility, yes, it does. Contains excess irritant, uh, the aeration material that you use. Uh, of course, if you put a rubber dam, it's on it. So yeah, it does. Makes pulpal access easy. Mm -mm -mm, no, it decreases medical legal liability, yes. It's mandatory uh, in many parts of the world that you should not start any procedure without rubber dam, especially the endo, because of various reasons. And in case you do start and some complication happens and the patient goes to complain against you, the first thing they will ask you is, did you put a rubber dam? And if you did not, then it's not acceptable. Then you are liable for whatever damage has occurred, even though it's your mistake or not. So, yes, it does decrease medical legal liability. See, it definitely increases visibility, placing a rubber dam, but it does not make the pulpal access easy. Example, the tooth is twisted, tilted, or uh, anything is covering it, etc. Rubber dam is not going to ease your pulpal access. That's you doing a root canal opening. So, it will increase the visibility of the area, but it will not make the access to the pulpal uh, area easy. So, that is the option of choice. You cannot manage to place a rubber dam on a tooth, whatever reason. Which one of the following solution is unacceptable? Meaning that if you cannot place the rubber dam, whatever option you choose is not acceptable. That means you should not or cannot do that. So in case you are unable to place a rubber dam, you can put a parachute chain. You can do crown lengthening so that the rubber dam can be accommodated. Restore using e-copper band, okay. Placing clam beak directly on the gingiva, that is also acceptable. But what is not acceptable is no dam. Basically, the question is saying that whatever treatment you're about to do on the tooth, you have to isolate it. In any of the various substitutes, if you cannot use a rubber dam, but you have to give a substitute. There should not be the option of no substitute, and that is a no dam. So that's why the answer should be no dam. Now, one of his teeth required extraction and you decided to go for extraction. The root tip got broken. Following extraction of teeth, root fragments can be left in place when? So, there will be various times in your clinical practice where either you are doing extraction for a child or an adult. Sometimes the root piece breaks inside. And then you have to decide whether you want to dig it up or you want to leave it. So, in which conditions would you decide to leave it? Now, the most ideal condition to leave the root tip inside is that it's really deep, it's short, and it's not infected at all. It's like vertically in the bone, and digging at it would be just damaging more of the structures. So, when it is not infected and it's really deep inside, it's really okay to leave the root piece inside, and you inform the patient about it. 
but if it's wobbly if it's infected then you must remove it or if you have to place a dental implant over that place then you have to remove it okay so the question is asking here if the root tip is broken then in which condition would you leave it behind now there is no plan to place a dental implant in the site so you leave the root piece that is not an ideal solution even if you're not going to place the dental implant if you can remove the root piece you should so it's not a wrong option exactly but i would place that on my low priority list the root is small not infected and located deep in the bone kind of a right answer the maxillary sinus is pneumatized and close to the tooth roots well this is also kind of a right answer because uh, sometimes if the root piece is really close to the sinus or any nerve you still can leave it inside the root fragment is mobile and no more than 7 to 8 mm in length well if it is mobile then you have to remove it so if i have to choose between option b and c i will choose the option b because that makes more sense and that's the most logical and safest of all so again uh, read more about oral surgery read about oral anterior fistula read uh, about implants whatever keywords you find here just read so that you can revise read more about rubber dam medical legal complications ethics uh yeah pretty much this and uh, leave your comments whether you understood this question or not it's always nice to hear from you all thank you